visible? Looking good. Perfect. All right. So um, thanks again for the invitation. Uh, today's talk, uh, I'm going to go through status epilepticus, some current concepts and management strategies. And uh, I'll just start with my disclosures. Um, I'll draw your attention to one here today. I am a, a Norse Institute Medical Advisory uh, Board member. And I will be sharing a little bit of information about this uh, in some of the slides today. So our learning objectives for today are that I wanted to talk about the uh, definitions and pathophysiological mechanisms underlying status epilepticus. And then uh, in uh, part two, we'll look at some management strategies and approaches. And then at the end, we'll discuss some outcomes uh, following status epilepticus and refractory status. So for part one, um, status epilepticus definitions and pathophysiology. Here I have the definition from the International League Against Epilepsy that was uh, published in 2015. I've put the whole definition down here because I think it's all important, but I've really highlighted in purple what I think are the most important elements from the point of view of the definition. So the first important part of the definition is that status epilepticus happens when we have a failure of mechanisms responsible for seizure termination. And then secondly, that there's an initiation of mechanisms that lead to abnormally prolonged seizures. And after that, we have long-term consequences from those seizures. So there's two uh, components of the definition that are really operational dimensions, and they're important um, from the point of view of timing. So there's T1, which you can see uh, reflects the length of the seizure. And in different types of seizures, this will be at different times. Um, but after the point where we identify T1, seizures are considered to be abnormally prolonged. And then there's T2, after which uh, ongoing seizure activity really leads to long-term damage. And so today I'll be focusing on uh, convulsive and then uh, non-convulsive comatose uh, associated uh, electroconvulsive seizures. Okay, so our fellow stroke neurologists are not the only ones who can claim that time is brain. And I think this is a really important concept. We have evidence from the literature that treating status early and quickly is really important. So if we have delays to administration of benzodiazepines greater than 10 minutes, that can be uh, independently associated with poor outcomes, um, meaning death, hypotension, uh, longer duration of convulsions, and the need to use uh, continuous anti-seizure medications. We also have retrospective uh, review data from international studies showing that uh, achieving seizure control in the first one to two hours can, is a determinant of outcome. So time really is brain and not just for TPA. When we look at the status epilepticus definitions from more of a picture point of view, um, I'm coming back to these two major components that I talked about. So there's a failure of the mechanisms intended to terminate seizures, and there's also initiation of mechanisms that lead to abnormally prolonged seizures. And in convulsive status epilepticus, our timeline is T1 at five minutes and T2 at 30 minutes. And between the times there, as we progress from T1 to T2, we get a reduced response to anti-seizure medications and then subsequent long-term consequences. If we think about electrographic status epilepticus, there may be no external or visibly uh, visible convulsions from a clinical point of view, but there can still be ongoing electrographic seizure. And based on the ACNS terminology for continuous EEG, these can be defined as uh, electrographic seizures lasting greater than 10 minutes continuously or uh, with a seizure burden of greater than 20% of any 60 minute period of recording. And this is because there's evidence to show that above a 20% seizure burden per 60 minutes uh, is associated with less good outcomes. So throughout, I'll show a few uh, images of EEG, um, a few epochs, I suppose, uh, because I feel compelled to show EEG. I don't like to talk about status without showing EEG, but some of them are uh, sprinkled in. Uh, so this is a, a patient where uh, they had anti-MA2 autoimmune encephalitis, and it was not clear that they were in status epilepticus when they arrived at our unit. They were aware, but not fully interactive. Um, they were in critical care. And on the first day, our EEG was on the top left here showing uh, generalized rhythmic delta activity. And on the second day, the recording was fairly similar. Um, there was reasonable background activity, but certainly bifrontally, there was this rhythmic delta activity, and occasionally there were sharply contoured waveforms. For these two days, the patient was on anti-seizure medication, uh, but they were not on any continuous agents. And as we kept recording, it became quite clear in this EEG that the rhythmic delta activity was indeed associated with sharply contoured waveforms and constituted spike and wave. So 
it's always prudent to continue recording if somebody is not um, is not as you expect from the point of view of the clinical uh, state. This is another example of a patient who has uh, electroconvulsive status epilepticus. Um, this patient uh, was comatose without any clear evidence of seizure um, clinically. And when the EEG was applied, we could see that there were continuous discharges um, and that there was also some background activity in between. Another example of status epilepticus, noting that all of these EEGs look quite different. Um, this is a 76-year-old man who'd had cardiac surgery uh, for an aortic valve replacement and postoperatively developed an acute renal failure, which is pretty common. Um, and uh, he had been on sedation after surgery, and when that was weaned, he didn't wake up as expected, which prompted the EEG. And here you can see there's diffuse, abnormal, and malignant appearing uh, activity with many different spikes. When the patient was treated with anti-seizure medication and with propofol, uh, you can see in the bottom right corner here that there's some resolution of that abnormal activity. Fortunately, in this case, uh, the patient did have some improvement on EEG. Uh, after about three weeks of therapy with continuous agents uh, or sedation and intermittent anti-seizure medications, the patient was still comatose appearing, but the EEG had improved to this without any sedation, but with some intermittent anti-seizure medication still. And in the bottom uh, right here, you can see when we called the patient's name, there was clear reactivity on the EEG, which portends a, a good prognosis, uh, or at least is, is reassuring. And uh, as such, we pursued care with this patient for uh, a week more, and then they were able to wake up uh, and interact with the environment around them and returned home and had quite a reasonable quality of life as per their family's report. So coming back to the pathophysiology uh, behind these seizures, when we think about normal seizure termination, uh, there's a lot of different mechanisms working to terminate a seizure. So we have transmission of, uh, or depletion of the neurotransmitters at the synaptic level. There's depletion of ATP, there's ionic changes that lead to changes in membrane polarization. We get changes in the acid base of the environment and also different uh, peptides such as adenosine and other peptides are released and we have increased GABA activity. There's also some evidence from animal studies showing that the EEG itself shows an increase in uh, both spatial and temporal synchronization as seizures progress from an ictal to a post-ictal state. And this uh, synchronization is maximum just prior to termination of a seizure and goes away after the seizure is terminated. Status epilepticus on EEG, however, is quite dynamic and this post-ictal state can't be reached. And the EEG goes through a state that's, uh, that these researchers have termed flickering, or there's fluctuations between your ictal and post-ictal EEG variants when they look at it over very small uh, 50 millisecond intervals. And so T1 really is a time at which we have faulty seizure termination, and we then get prolonged seizures and failure of that critical transition from the ictal to post-ictal state. And thinking about that with pictures, a normal seizure would start in the ictal state, transition through changes in the EEG and other physiological mechanisms, and then finally the brain reaches a post-ictal state. In abnormal seizure termination, this threshold of going through transition and flickering of the EEG and all the physiological changes just can't be reached, and the EEG and patient will go between this ictal um, and almost post-ictal state but never quite reach it. So we get status because we are favoring a seizure state as opposed to a postictal state. This is an example of a patient who had a relatively malignant EEG with uh, no background activity in between because they were being administered continuous sedation. And what you see here is uh, our epochs without any external stimulus. When I move through the subsequent epoch, you can see in the right posterior quadrant um, here, and here around P4 and O2 and T6, that there's a change in the frequency. And despite being on continuous anti-seizure uh, or continuous anesthetic and intermittent anti-seizure medications, this patient spontaneously develops a seizure, um, which is emerging from the generalized periodic discharges, which we're seeing. And the seizure is in fact focal, but it does have involvement uh, throughout. So coming back to the pathophysiology, we see a lot of receptor changes that help maintain status and lead uh, from the transition of T1 to T2, which is abnormally prolonged seizures. And here we have a presynaptic neuron and your postsynaptic neuron. And uh, at 
at the early stages, we get internalization of the GABA receptors, making it harder to target these receptors with our first line therapies. There's an increase in excitation because there's increased expression of NMDA receptors at the postsynaptic neuron. There's changes in adenosine receptors and other presynaptic receptors, including gamma B. And there's also uh, abnormalities and changes in the way the AMPA receptor works, leading to calcium accumulation and neuronal cell death. And then finally, uh, there's an increase in expression of drug transport of proteins at the level of the postsynaptic neuron, just at the time that we're trying to use anti-seizure medications and the brain is actually working against us by trying to pump these back out of the neuron. So there's a lot of different mechanisms that are ongoing and support this transition from T1 to T2, not only at the cellular level, like we just talked about, um, but in the greater brain environment, there's breakdown of the blood brain barrier, which is likely associated with inflammation. We know that there's ongoing inflammation because we see interleukin one, TNF, alpha, and interleukin six is among other cytokines that are increased and we see microglial activation. Um, and then there's also other pro-epileptogenic peptides, which increase with status epilepticus. And then coming back to the EEG studies, we see that there's persistent synchronization of the EEG um, and the brain just can't transition to that post state. Unfortunately, prolonged seizures are harder to treat. Um, and that is because of those changes in the GABA receptors and other receptor changes. Um, and the changes uh, in the state of the receptors also because of abnormal phosphorylation and other uh, processes. So when we can't terminate a seizure, this can lead to refractory status epilepticus. So we already talked about status epilepticus, but refractory status is a uh, status that, um, that is quite prolonged. So usually status epilepticus uh, will respond to first or second line treatments, but if they don't and it lasts longer than 30 minutes, then we call it refractory status epilepticus. And then uh, super refractory status epilepticus is uh, refractory status epilepticus that continues beyond 24 hours, despite all of your best therapies, which we'll talk about in a little bit, or that recurs after 24 hours of um, anesthetic and withdrawal of that anesthetic agent. So there's two common reasons why refractory status epilepticus or super refractory status epilepticus can happen. And that's usually because the process driving the status epilepticus hasn't yet been resolved. For example, there's an underlying infection, such as a meningitis. You may have started antibiotics, but they may not have had full control of the infection yet. Or there may be an underlying autoimmune process that hasn't yet uh, been treated or targeted because it hasn't been identified. Another major reason is just changes in the brain that have happened from the prolonged status make it a lot harder to revert the brain back into a post state, kind of like we talked about before. The longer the status goes on, the harder it is to get over this threshold in order to reach a post state. So once we get to T2, we have physiological changes that are more permanent that happen. Uh, and these are also multiple. You see breakdown of the blood-brain barrier that worsens uh, with inflammation. You get neuronal cell death. Um, there's altered network connectivity, altered uh, receptors and gene expression, and altered neurotransmitter release. This is another uh, few epochs of a very challenging uh, case we had of a 21 year old with Norse or new onset refractory status epilepticus with very refractory seizures. And in this case, uh, the EEG looks very suppressed. Uh, you're just looking at essentially a flat background with a little bit of intervening artifact. At this time, the patient was on propofol, midazolam and isoflurane. Um, but unfortunately, when there are discharges, you can see they're very, very malignant um, and very sharply contoured. And it was not easy to achieve uh, any, any ratio of birth suppression. Um, and EEG seemed to oscillate between uh, ongoing seizures or almost complete suppression. And here you see the EEG escalating. And unfortunately, despite having achieved a almost complete suppression a few epochs ago, the patient now has a seizure without any external stimulus that clearly is evolving um, and is very malignant. So unfortunately, in a patient like this, we're uh, looking at the permanent neuronal cell death and changes. And some of this happens because you have sustained neuroexcitation, you know, despite your best efforts to treat it. This leads to injury of the hippocampus, especially in CA3 and CA1 areas. You get calcium disturbances with increased intracellular calcium, and this affects mitochondrial function. This leads to reactive oxygen species, which then cause DNA damage and further dysfunction at the level of the mitochondria. 
And systemically, you see changes which uh, support this process also. There's hypotension, hypoxia, and acidosis that can happen if uh, interventions aren't, aren't initiated quickly. We have evidence in imaging studies um, looking at long-term changes in super refractory status epilepticus. And it's clear that we get progressive cortical and subcortical atrophy. This particular set of MRI images shows that we have uh, at the acute stages at less than 14 days of refractory status epilepticus, there is brightness of the hippocampi bilaterally. After three months, this patient has uh, cortical atrophy uh, continues to have some bright signal in the hippocampus, but uh, is much smaller. And you see that the temporal horns are larger. And after three years, this patient's no longer in status, but their convalescent, uh, you know, their recovering brain shows substantial degree of atrophy, as well as um, abnormally small hippocampi. More locally, we have done some retrospective studies looking at our cohort of super refractory status epilepticus and found similar findings. Um, if we look at the ventricle to brain volume over time, we note that patients with poor clinical outcome especially, but all patients overall have an increase in the ventricle to brain ratio over time. So the ventricles get bigger, as you can see here, and the brain volumes get smaller overall. If we zero in on the subcortical gray matter over on the right side of the screen here, you can see that the subcortical gray matter volume gets smaller, um, although this trend is less clear. And in patients who have poor outcome, they have much greater decrease in the volume of their subcortical gray matter. We did do a sort of a subgroup analysis of this looking at different gray matter structures, and it didn't seem to affect them on an individual basis more or preferentially, it affected them globally. So underlying these processes, there's increasing interest in looking at biomarkers to see if we can help use them both from uh, the point of view of treatment targets, but also from the point of view of uh, prognostication. So when we look at neuronal cell death, uh, we have neuron specific enolase that gets released and uh, can be measured as well as tau that's measured in CSF. Neuroinflammation, we can measure looking at uh, cytokines such as interleukin one and six and that the microglia. There's leakage of the blood-brain barrier that I talked about earlier, and we can look at this by uh, comparing the ratio of albumin in the cerebrospinal fluid compared to that in the blood. There's extravasation of inflammatory cells, and we can see gliosis, which we can measure with GFAP and S100P. There's also other processes going on that maybe we can measure um, using serum biomarkers. So looking at this, uh, just to tie things together, we have a lot of changes that occur with sustained seizures. And inflammation is currently one therapeutic target. We're looking at trying to reduce inflammation with immunosuppressive treatments. There's also an increased interest um, coming out of France, uh, looking at cholesterol synthesis dysregulation and how that might be neurotoxic to the brain in uh, refractory status. There's altered gene expressions, and some groups are looking at altering this gene expression, uh, for example, mTOR that's increased using medications such as rapamycin. Neurotransmitter release becomes abnormal and there's cholinergic dysfunction with sustained status. There's uh, increased oxidative stress, and there's also the dysfunction in the blood-brain barrier, which leads to astrocyte activation. So all of these mechanisms are important to keep in mind so that we can try and target our therapy in a rational way. Essentially, uh, developing therapies are aimed at trying to target multiple cause or multiple uh, sustaining events for status or their drivers. And there's some studies looking at the use of NMDA receptor uh, modulation in concert with benzodiazepines or calcineurin antagonists, um, inhibitors of inflammation such as anakinra or tocilizumab, and then other strategies to target your GEPA receptor system. So to kind of summarize part one, there's pathophysiological events that are both uh, supporting and propagating status epilepticus. There's faulty seizure termination and mechanisms promoting prolonged seizures, which lead to status epilepticus. We talked about the mechanisms that support ongoing seizures and the pathophysiological changes that occur as a, as a result of these, and they occur at many different levels of the nervous system. And then we try and use rational polytherapy to target these and to develop new therapeutic targets for status. Okay, so for part two, um, there's uh, management strategies that we'll talk about. Let's hold on here. There we go. Okay.
So in status epilepticus, our choice of therapies uh, often depends on the etiology of status and the type of status epilepticus and also the clinical context of the patient. So there are therapeutic algorithms that we use, especially early on in status, but, but unfortunately it's not a one size fits all type of process. Um, this flowchart comes from the uh, an epilepsy currents guideline uh, paper. Um, and it was uh, published in 2016, which is relevant in a few minutes. So the timeline that we we're talking about with T1 and T2 is uh, outlined on the left here. And the interventions that we have are in the bigger rectangles. So essentially your first five minutes of somebody with status epilepticus are aimed at ABCs, just like any other resuscitation for the patient. You wanna make sure that they're vitally stable and being monitored and there's oxygen. Once a seizure becomes uh, prolonged and goes past the five minutes leading up to the 20 or 30 minutes, then uh, first line therapy is indicated. And there's a lot of different uh, choices from the point of view of evidence, but largely uh, IM midazolam is similar to IV lorazepam, which is similar to IV diazepam. And you need to use the one that you have uh, closest and uh, you can get to most uh, quickly for the patient. After we reach T2, at about 20 to 40 minutes, this is your second phase of therapy. If you have not been successful with benzodiazepines, then you proceed to anti-seizure medications. Um, and what, when this was published, your main anti-seizure medications to consider, and uh, based on current therapies, would be phosphenitoin or phenytoin, depending on what country you're in, valproic acid, and levotracetam. The guidelines also suggest that intravenous phenobarbital is very reasonable if you don't have others available. And then after that, once we reach our third phase of therapy, there's not a lot of evidence base to, uh, to guide us, but we'll talk through that a little bit. All right, so um, as I alluded to before, time to seizure control really does matter. Um, if This is a table from a study that looked at multiple studies from around the world, um, their duration of status, uh, uh, at, between the kind of 40, 45 minute and two hour mark mostly. And all of them consistently showed that uh, there's a higher percentage of outcome um, with increased odds ratio for poor outcome when uh, status lasts longer. So a longer duration of seizures in, uh, leads to increased morbidity and mortality. And the sooner we can treat, the more likely it is to be successful. So if we look at the best current evidence for second line anti-seizure medication after benzodiazepines, there's recently been three quite helpful trials. Um, the ECLIPSE trial, CONCEPT trial, and the ESET trial. Um, the ECLIPSE trial and CONCEPT trial were looking at therapy in pediatrics and comparing phenytoin versus levotracetam. And both of these were open label randomized controlled trials with uh, between two and 300 uh, participants. Both trials uh, came to the conclusion that essentially levotracetam and phenytoin are uh, relatively equivalent for second line management of pediatric convulsive status epilepticus. If we're looking at uh, populations of both pediatric and adult patients, then we look at the ESET trial. They did a similar study, but they had three arms where they compared phosphenitoin, levotracetam, and valproic acid. And they included people from age two to 94 years. Um, this was also randomized controlled trial, but it was blinded. And the uh, essential outcome from that was that uh, phosphenitoin, levotracetam, and valproic acid are uh, relatively equal from the point of view of the uh, effectiveness for second line um, anti seizure or second line uh, status treatment. So, when we look at refractory status epilepticus or super refractory status epilepticus, that's where we have less evidence. Um, we don't have any specific guidelines for this, and so we fall back on the uh, guidelines for status epilepticus management, such as those published in 2012 and by the Neurocritical Care Society. Typically, we use continuous EEG monitoring, induction of uh, seizure suppression or birth suppression on the EEG, and then rational polytherapy when we combine medications and anesthetics, kind of like I talked about before. If you're targeting birth suppression, um, there's not good evidence to tell you how far to go with that, but birth suppression, uh, essentially by expert consensus, should be uh, maintained for about 24 to 48 hours. And uh, if you are able to achieve an interburst interval of 10 seconds or so, that's pretty reasonable. And then after 24 to 48 hours, the idea is to taper in the anesthesia over six to 12 hours um, so that there's no abrupt withdrawal. We do not have a lot of data to support this, however. So um, when you're choosing an intravenous anesthetic treatment, uh, 
we do have some studies to guide us. Uh, there have been comparisons of propofol, benzodiazepine, and barbiturates um, in systematic reviews, but not head to head. Um, and these show that they're relatively equal, but they each have their own set of side effects. So it depends on who your patient is and what you have available. There's also ketamine, which is becoming increasingly popular uh, and upstreamed in the algorithms uh, for, for those who treat refractory status epilepticus. We like to use it earlier if possible, because we think it may be more effective early on. And this obviously targets NMDA receptors. And then it's important to keep in mind that general anesthetics are not only uh, targeting the GABA receptors, but they also target other receptors in the brain, um, including in the brain stem, sodium channels, glycine receptors, potassium channels, and other things. All of the anesthetic agents can help you achieve birth suppression and unconsciousness. They just do it by slightly different mechanisms. So it's not, uh, it's not always difficult to achieve birth suppression, although I did show you some examples where it can be. Um, I think that one of the more challenging aspects of refractory status epilepticus management is what to do uh, when you're weaning and what to accept on the EEG or what not to accept. And uh, you know, when a wean is going to be successful or not, is there anything that can tell you about that? And we have relatively little literature on that, um, but the consensus is if you're weaning and seizures recur, that we put that patient back into seizure suppression or into birth suppression, depending on your approach, and uh, that you likely add in another anti-seizure medication and then try again in 24 to 48 hours. There's no real uh, kind of next step or consensus on what to do if uh, when you wean sedation, you see icter, ictal, interictal continuum discharges, such as lateralized periodic discharges or generalized periodic discharges or something that's not quite a seizure, but it's a little bit concerning. So there's a couple of studies that have looked at this retrospectively, both quite small, um, but I think they're interesting. Um, this one was uh, published in Neurocritical Care in 2016, and they looked retrospectively at a cohort of 19 patients with refractory status epilepticus. And in these patients, there was an unsuccessful wean um, that was predicted based on the EEG before the wean started. So in patients who had a high percentage of epileptiform abnormality within their bursts, um, or very high amplitude bursts greater than 125 microvolts, or very monomorphic bursts, these patients were more likely to have an unsuccessful wean from uh, general anesthetics. Factors that they looked at that did not predict the wean outcome was the average birth suppression ratio. So maybe it doesn't matter what that ratio is for you and what matters more is the content of the EEG. Uh, the duration of the interburst interval also didn't seem to have any correlation with the successful wean. Neither did the duration of the bursts and neither did the stess score. And we'll talk about the stess score a little bit later. So when you're weaning uh, anesthetic, in the case of refractory status epilepticus, it's not uncommon to see ictal, interictal continuum patterns um, in the form of lateralized periodic discharges, generalized periodic discharges, um, and, and those would be the most common and the most concerning. The challenge really is that you can see these discharges either in advanced status epilepticus or when you're weaning medication, and we know that some anesthetics can induce these patterns. And so if you see these patterns, Maybe it doesn't actually mean your wean is going to be unsuccessful. So another group looked specifically at these patterns uh, retrospectively, and they published in Neurocritical Care in 2018. They had a case series of nine patients where they uh, went through what they called an aggressive anesthetic wean, despite seeing ictal interictal patterns like I outlined. So what they mean by an aggressive anesthetic wean is that they continued to wean the anesthetic agent despite emergence of ictal interictal continuum and they completed that wean within 24 hours. So it wasn't aggressive from the point of view of how quickly it went, uh, but it was more aggressive from the point of view that despite seeing concerning discharges, they continued, continued to wean. They used this approach, um, and then they looked for features of the EEG that might help them predict whether or not it was going to work. So in patients where they were successfully able to wean the EEG, um, the EEG was continuous and more organized appearing. Uh, when they when they looked at the anterior posterior gradient, it was not reversed, so it was within uh, the more normal ranges. The voltages on the EEG were normal, so they weren't uh, suppressed or low voltage, and they weren't exceedingly high. Um, and the EEG showed some reactivity despite those ictal interictal continuum discharges. 
So in three out of those nine patients, uh, they did relapse back into seizures or status epilepticus, but in six out of the nine patients, they were able to successfully wean the anesthetic despite having seen ictal interictal continuum. And those patterns actually uh, can disappear after the sedation is completely pro uh, processed through their system. IIC patterns also did not necessarily predict recurrence of status epilepticus. Um, so basically uh, the IIC patterns, we don't exactly know where they're coming from in this anesthetic weaning, but it might represent the transition in the state of the brain. Um, you can continue to wean if you have reassuring EEG characteristics, which I think is quite comforting because uh, it also makes me nervous to have somebody on prolonged anesthesia for other reasons. And it's always good to keep in mind that anesthetics can sometimes cause transient changes in your EEG also. Clearly, we need some more uh, rigorous and larger studies to look at this more uh, in detail, but I think these are two promising and interesting studies. So when weaning is unsuccessful, then you're in a position where you're managing super refractory status epilepticus. And then we need to start thinking about other therapies because clearly our benzodiazepine, our second line agent and our anesthetic haven't been successful. So at this point in time, there's a myriad of different types of approaches that can be taken. And oftentimes we do many of them at once. Um, the ketogenic diet is become, uh, becoming an inter increasingly well uh, researched uh, and, and has a good body of evidence to su suggest it can be effective, although it can be tricky. Um, and this is both for pediatric and for adult populations. There are surgical approaches, especially for uh, focal onset of seizures. There's immune-based therapies, which I'll talk about a little bit more, um, temperature and electricity-based. And there's also uh, just remembering to do cofactor replacement like pyridoxine and magnesium, uh, which can be depleted during status. And then there's also vigilant um, prevention of ICU complications. I wanted to say a few uh, words about neurostimulation and super refractory status epilepticus. This is one area of increasing interest. Um, locally, we've had three patients with super refractory status epilepticus for whom we've used a vagus nerve stimulator. Um, and we found it to be effective in all three of the cases. Um, increasingly, we've used it earlier on in the status epilepticus. Uh, and our approach has been that after the VNS is placed, that over about 48 hours, we rapidly increase uh, the duty cycle and the output current. Um, and in each case, uh, after reaching target therapeutic ranges, we've been able to wean the anesthesia uh, successfully. Um, other centers have used a very different approach. So when they place the VNS, they'll use a very rapid cycling approach. Um, and this is anecdotal. There's no published papers about this, but they may use a very uh, brief period of stimulus with a very brief off period. There's also a systematic review of uh, case series using VNS, suggesting that it's likely safe and it might be effective, although our overall quality of evidence is still pretty low. And then there's some emerging literature to suggest uh, RNS and DBS, as well as electroconvulsive therapy can be uh, used. So I wanted to talk about new onset refractory status epilepticus too, because these are a uh, large subgroup of patients with super refractory status epilepticus. So going back to a consensus definition that was uh, published in 2018, uh, new onset refractory status epilepticus is a clinical presentation. And I think that's really important to underline. It's not a diagnosis. It's a clinical presentation because there's a lot of things that can cause NORS or fires. And so NORS itself is essentially a refractory status epilepticus where we cannot diagnose the cause before 72 hours after it started. There's some conditions that you have to fulfill, including the patient cannot have a prior history of epilepsy. There's no pre-existing neurological disorder. In other words, the person's previously healthy and there's no clear acute cause. So no new structural lesion, toxic uh, insult or metabolic cause. And fires can be considered a subgroup of NORS. Um, fires is a febrile infection related epilepsy syndrome. And as previously or originally thought to apply only to pediatric populations, but there's certainly a group of adults who present similarly. And the only requisite here is that they fulfill the criteria for Norse, but they also have a febrile infection uh, within two weeks to 24 hours prior to the start of their refractory status epilepticus. So as I alluded to before, it's a clinical presentation and it's not a diagnosis. So Norse is actually a lot of things. It's um, refractory status without a clear cause. It's super refractory status without a clear cause. It includes febrile infection-related epilepsy syndrome, 
Um, it could be status epilepticus caused by an infection that we were unable to identify in the first 72 hours. It could be cryptogenic status epilepticus that is very difficult to control. And it could be autoimmune causes for uh, refractory status epilepticus. So NORS itself um, represents a high proportion of patients with super refractory status epilepticus. And there's a high proportion of NORS patients who remain cryptogenic despite weeks of extensive investigations. When we do find a cause in the half where a cause is eventually identified, the most common causes are an autoimmune cause or a perineoplastic cause, and also a smaller number or proportion are in, caused by an infection. Uh, unfortunately, there's a poor outcome in a high proportion of patients who present with new onset refractory status epilepticus, and most survivors uh, remain on anti seizure medication. So in the case of Norse, seizure management happens alongside investigations. So you're somewhat operating in the dark from the point of view that you don't know the underlying cause, but you're still trying to aggressively treat the patient to improve their outcome. When we don't know the cause, because of the percentages that we've seen in retrospective studies, we assume that the etiology is likely autoimmune and we'll start treating presumptively for an autoimmune cause or a perineoplastic cause, uh, regardless of uh, having identified an etiology or not. So in this case, for immune-based therapies, your first line would be pulse steroids or IVIG um, and potentially plasmapheresis. Second line treatments could include something like rituximab, cyclophosphamide, and there's increasing uh, interest in uh, agents such as tocilizumab or anakinra. We do not have a lot of evidence and there's no controlled studies at this stage, but certainly uh, there are collective groups uh, trying to work towards uh, multi-centered studies in order to better address this. I wanted to show you uh, this website here. Um, you might not be able to see it at the top of your screen because uh, if the Zoom thing is up there, but basically this is uh, the Norse Institute website um, and its URL is norseinstitute.org. I just wanted to bring it to your attention because it's a resource both for medical professionals and for patients and families. I won't go through the whole website for you here, but under medical professionals, there's an algorithm for the early management of NORSE. And there's also an investigative uh, table that uh, outlines all of the different investigative treatments that one could go through or consider depending on the region and the, the time of year that the patient presents with. And then unfortunately, NORSE is a very rare disorder. And so patients and families often can't find reliable information. And so there's a section where patients and families can go to it well, usually the patient can't acutely, but sometimes subcutely. The families can go acutely though and learn and read a bit more about NORS. So to summarize part two, management of stat refractory status is really guided by the etiology. There's four main categories that we think about, inflammatory or autoimmune, infectious, uh, we didn't talk a lot about, but sometimes genetic or congenital causes as well as toxic causes. Our first line treatment for status itself is uh, benzodiazepines, we want to avoid treatment delays at all costs. And actually we have our own door to needle time and epilepsy from the point of view of the earlier you can get benzodiazepines in the better. When it comes to second line treatment, uh, our best evidence suggests that we can choose either phenytoin, levotracetam or valproic acid. Um, and that these can be uh, used with essentially whichever one is best for your patient uh, and you can obtain fastest. And then rational therapy is aiming at uh, treating the underlying cause while you treat the seizures or status. So lastly, I'll touch on outcomes just a little bit. Um, we know with refractory status epilepticus and super refractory status epilepticus that patients do less well than, than uh, status epilepticus itself. So the mean hospital stay is quite a bit longer at almost a month for these folks. Um, patients have a much higher degree of mortality. Depending on the study you look at, it's anywhere between 23 and 43% mortality. And outcomes at discharge uh, are number one, difficult to predict, but often quite poor and measured uh, at least coarsely right now in the literature by modified Rankin score between four and six. So this study here is from a group in France. If we look at column on the right, you see super refractory status epilepticus. And on almost all accounts compared to status epilepticus overall, you have higher ICU mortality, higher hospital mortality, and less good outcomes clinically. This is a paper by Dr. Amorim um, in the US. I quite like this paper. Um, hopefully you can see the top there, but essentially, uh, 
this is a conceptual uh, figure to help you think about your outcome in your patient with status epilepticus. So when somebody has status epilepticus, there's the primary issue that causes, uh, that causes the status epilepticus. And this often is related to a primary neurologic injury. Secondly, you have status epilepticus itself and the patterns on the ictal interictal continuum. And while these continue, you get perfusion and metabolic changes and excitotoxicity in the brain and increased seizure burden. And this leads to secondary neurologic injury in the brain. And finally, with the orange square here, we have our, our treatments, and these are uh, quite aggressive in somebody with refractory status epilepticus. So these in and of themselves can also lead to morbidity for patients and sometimes related mortality. So our eventual outcome for any one patient is kind of like a sliding scale that weighs all of these three components. Their pre-morbid comorbidities are important. The actual etiology of the seizures matters for their outcome. Uh, how severe the status epilepticus was and what kind of complications they incur. And so uh, where all of these fit on that spectrum is different for every patient and quite difficult to predict. And finally, when you're in the ICU, there are critical illness complications that are, um, can be quite substantial and, and can be life-threatening for some patients. So I find the, the most concerning from the point of view of treating status itself is the non-obstructive paralytic ileus that some patients can uh, experience. If they develop an ileus, then you often can't feed using the gut for a period of time, and it means you can't use your anti-seizure medications through the gut. And that means your, uh, your different agents that you can treat the patient is suddenly reduced to a uh, few medications you can give through the intravenous. Uh, cardiac arrhythmias are not uncommon, as well as pulmonary edema. And then hypotension, uh, sepsis, and pneumonia are very common. Obviously, we work hard to avoid these in refractory status, but they're unfortunately part of the ICU stay. So when we look at trying to predict outcome, we have here the STESS score, which is the status epilepticus severity score. And there's a couple of other scores. Essentially, it goes through the patient's clinical state, their worst seizure type, their age, and their history of previous seizures. This is probably the easiest scale to use for everyday care, as it's pretty easy to fill out. Um, it's uh, helpful for predicting patient survival on, on the lower scores, but it's less helpful otherwise, and there is a ceiling effect at 65. So the STESS score was subsequently modified into the modified STESS score. And I'll go through the other, a couple of other outcome scores here too. This one incorporates the MRS pre-morbidly into the STESS, and it also changes the cutoff age to 70. So there's less ceiling effect, and it, it helps uh, predicting on the mortality end of the scale also. There's also the EMSE score, which was derived from data worldwide rather than in a localized area of making it uh, potentially a more generalizable score when you're looking at outcomes. And then there's also the ENDIT score, which is one of the only scores looking more at functional outcomes. Uh, finally, I just wanted to uh, let you know about the Norse and Fires Family Registry. This is also through the Norse Institute, and I'm the, the PI on this study, but this is a registry where we're trying to gain more information about Norse and fires that we usually aren't able to get at acutely. Um, it's also a registry that aims to provide families or, or survivors of Norse an avenue to contribute to systematic research that is uh, vetted by uh, an ethics board without necessarily having to be cared for or tied to an academic center that has an REB. So we are using REDCap to gather data and it is, data is entered through a web interface. Survivors of, of uh, Norse or fires as well as their surrogates or their healthcare team can uh, input data and there's a consent form right uh, with the, the database itself before you enter. And the consent form provides information for all three of these different people um, depending on what is most applicable. So far in the English version, uh, we have 45 participants from 12 countries. Um, we do have uh, a Spanish and French version, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, our, overall, there's been a mean age of 23 years old with a range of three to 78 in our participants. The most common uh, symptoms at onset have been flu-like symptoms, fever and headache. And seizures are only the first symptom in, in less than half of the patients. As you can see, we've had data points from many parts of the world at this point in time. Um, looking at outcomes is one of the focuses, as well as looking at quality of life, because these are very difficult to capture in uh, studies, given how uncommon Norse is. 
So survivors unfortunately have on average uh, quite poor outcome with epilepsy and greater than 10 seizures per month. They're on 3.9 uh, anti-seizure medications on average. And unfortunately their quality of life matches that uh, in that their quality of life is rated at 3.9 out of 10 with 10 being a great quality of life and zero being the worst. So people who survive Norris have a very serious impact on their overall quality of life. Um, this is how you can access the registry. The first link here is actually through the Norse Institute website that I uh, showed you earlier. Um, if you have eligible patients you're caring for or who have previously had Norse that you're continuing to carry for, or care for, um, then they would be eligible to enter information um, and they can do it independently of your institutional um, REB. Another way is through our direct link here um, or to contact me or my uh, research coordinator by um, email. So in conclusion, um, I think we've gone over the fact that status epilepticus is a medical emergency and that time really is brain. And we have our own door to needle time, which really matters for our patients. Um, we do have a lot of options now with good evidence base for our first and second line treatment. And our treatment really has to be tailored to the underlying cause. And when there's no clearly identified underlying cause for uh, refractory or super refractory status, then we uh, assume an immune-based etiology. I'm gonna conclude here so that we can move on to questions. Thank you for that. That was amazing. Thank you, Dr. Goffman. So we have